speaker is Malcolm Vadreen or Matt, Big Matt, Dr. Vadreen. Um, Malcolm is a retired uh, biology professor from LSU E. Um, his family has created the Cajun Prairie Gardens in Eunice. Uh, Mac uh, was instrumental in the development of the Cajun Prairie Restoration Project, uh, which are the three tracks that the Cajun Prairie Habitat Preservation Society have in uh, Eunice, Louisiana. Um, he is the author of the book uh, Cajun Prairie, A Natural History. And um, he has a blog at CajunPrairieGardens.com. He, he served on the Coastal Prairie Partnership Board for, yeah, for four years. And he is the quintessential master naturalist. There, I don't think there's anybody better than Matt. He's published in everything from prairies, dragonflies, mosquitoes, Muscles. Mussels, mites, aquatic mites, a lot of um, <laughs> leprosy, um, <laughs> rotifers, yeah. rotifers uh, and, and the list goes on and on. I think he has the most publications out of any professor at LSU E in the last <laughs> decade or two. Uh, and I'll turn it over to, to the master naturalist himself. Good afternoon. Thanks for the steering committee for inviting me. I was shocked to say the least when <laughs> Brian called and said he wanted me to speak about something to do with connecting audiences to Louisiana prairies. I've done this for the last 30 years, and I can say I haven't done that good a job because the, the movement has been very slow. I usually push for much more obvious results. But Hey, you're here, great start. Uh, my job here today is to familiarize you with some of the potential lessons that you might want to teach using a garden. I mean, my talk's gonna be like totally different from Jaime's talk and Cassidy's talk. I mean, I don't expect you to do a damn thing. <laughs> Assimilate. Connecting to audiences through Louisiana Prairie Gardens. I have, uh, if you go to my blog site, I put the program up there and uh, let's see how many weeks. Uh, and also written up a sketch of what I was going to say. Probably I'll say nothing like that which I've written up because uh, I always do a thing off the cuff. Cajun Prairie Gardens, this is my wife and I's project. Uh, at home, and of course everything that I think about relates to that garden. And of course relates to the life within the garden because everything in my experience as an ecologist uh, is that everything is connected. And this is the ultimate lesson when we realize everything is connected, it dawns upon us one morning that we're connected to everything. And when you make that realization, you've taken your first step into understanding what ecology is all about. We are part of ecology. Most people don't believe that. They have no clue. When I took ecology, this is uh, the lesson I was taught. Uh, my professor was an earthworm specialist, Dr. Walter Harmon up at LSU. And he saw the world totally differently from everybody else that I'd ever known who was a biologist. Because for him, everything was from the earth up. I mean, earthworms first. It didn't make sense to the earthworms. It didn't make sense. And that takes a bit of getting used to. Anyway, we want to connect all the dots. And the dots begin as very large, fuzzy things, like the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere. But then you realize they all interconnect. And the easiest place to see that is any place on Earth where you're standing, and any place where you're standing on Earth is a garden. If it's not, it's a human structure that's built. And we have to begin to think that we are all within a garden of our own making. And so you make a garden that teaches you lessons, that helps you acquaint yourself with what's going on around you. They call that the pedosphere, the place you're walking on, right? So 
If we can get everybody to think they're living in a garden, then they'll begin to build better gardens. Uh, this is a slide I'll use later, but this is a wonderful slide by Heiden Natura, which shows you something most interesting about what most people think of a garden, their lawn. And their lawn is literally, when you think about it ecologically, nothing, zero, right? or damn close. The prairie, on the other hand, is magnificent. Below ground, above ground, and interconnecting with all your hydrosphere. So my presentation today is going to have a little bit of all kinds of things. Uh, I'm going to look at several different programs I've presented and hopefully I'll give you ideas as to what you will present. The goal is that you come up with your own presentation and go present it somewhere. That's, that's your obligation if you have one. A bit of history. So this prairie you're in today is the Great Southwestern Prairie, uh, also known as the Cajun Prairie. It was a two and a half million acre prairie back 1,700 years ago. That's a, excuse me, in the year 1,700, right? It might have been so 1,700 years ago. <laughs> we guess it's about 10,000 years old, right? Uh, the French divided it up, and then the Spanish came and divided it up, and then the Germans came and divided it up, and then the Americans came and divided it up, and it exists as it is today. Here's a general map showing you that great triangle, and of course, Lafayette is up right here, right? on the eastern half. Our gardens are like right in the middle, right? So. Prairies are far maintained. In fact, most ecosystems east of the Rocky Mountains in this, on this continent were far maintained, with some few exceptions. Right? So far is something that's part of your lesson. When you remove far from the prairie, you change how the prairie behaves a very distinctively different garden. And when you go to the Eunice Prairie tomorrow, you can see the Eunice Prairie that wasn't burned this year. And so you'll see something that's not typical of that prairie when it was burned. So those prairies were discovered, the remnants, by Charles and myself. I was following along back in the mid-1980s. Uh, we visited a number of railroad tracks, and that's where we found the prairie, as thin strips of remnant along these railroad tracks. So you can see the railroad track on the right, the highway on the left, and there's the prairie in between. Large circles of grasses, that's a big roost there, along with lots and lots of sunflowers. Prairies as we know them are just loaded with grasses, peas, mints, sunflowers, milkweeds, things of that sort all groups of plants, plus some lilies, right? Lots of areas were neat little vignettes uh, of uh, wildflowers. So extremely beautiful, especially after a burn. Just breathtaking. So here's your Texas brown-eyed Susan. Yeah, we have that in Louisiana, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick Stan. So this, this is one slide I have that competes with Hyman's presentation. <laughs> Uh, obedient plants and things of that sort. Each month, it's a different garden. So you can advertise it as a butterfly garden in one month, and next month it's a pollinator garden, and next month it's a carbon sequestration garden. When you walk out in the Cajun prairie tomorrow, think carbon sequestration garden, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the most common wildflower in southwest Louisiana, according to Dr. Allen, uh, was the blazing star. We have five different kinds that come, and they literally blanketed the prairie during the months of July, August, September. In fact, in the Eunice Prairie, last year after the burn, there were 50,000 of them. I know them all at one time, just took your breath away. There's Gail, and our son. This must be like almost 28 years ago on a tour of one of these remnants. Friend Bruno Vasari, who was one, probably the only real student I ever had, who became a prairie uh, scholar. Uh, he's up in Winona, Wisconsin, doing, or uh, Minnesota, excuse me, doing prairies today. And of course, there's Charles Allen. This is on the back cover of my book, walking through tall grass prairie during this time of the year, right? So 
think tall. Right? This is one in one of the remnants. But of course, next month and beginning this month, the prairie browns down. In French, we call it the pie rouge, the pie jaune, representing the fact that it all turns brown on the day of. Um, and of course, it looks like straw. Pie means straw. So I put together a book uh, five years ago, six years ago, uh, a textbook on the prairies in southwestern Louisiana. It's almost out of print. I don't think anybody can download and fix a copy, so it'll be gone unless you find some money. Uh, so my talk today is about gardens. And of course, gardens that man creates. So gardens and man. We're going to focus on prairie garden because that's kind of the topics we have. But we want to make sure we understand that garden contains all the basic spheres of existence, the biosphere mixed in with the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the lithosphere. So we'll try to garden with all those areas in mind. Man-made gardens have to be ornamental. Either they got to be super colorful or they've got to be uh, really impressive, attracting butterflies and things of that sort. Or they've got to have really distinctive shapes, right? But yet our lawns are our most popular garden. But it's got almost none of this, except it's green and it's open and there's something about human nature that makes us love this openness. So anyway, this must be ornamental to get accepted by our general public. So if you're trying to sell a, a prairie that's not ornamental, you've got a tough row to hold. <laughs> and having hold a bunch of rows in my day, <laughs> I can tell you that's, that's bad. So I, what I push is theme-oriented gardening. If you don't know the theme of your garden, you've got a rough time selling it. Those, those themes can be very specific, like a sunflower garden or a pea garden. A scent garden, a touch garden, an audio garden, because a lot of people like to get into a garden and listen. In fact, I think that's what Cassidy said. Uh, a predator garden, dragonflies, damselflies, a hummingbird garden, a songbird garden, butterfly gardens, monarch gardens, big deal. Or even history lesson gardens. Because I can talk several hours about the history of the prairie and the people that settled it. Or your team can be much more broad. Prairies, pollinators, predators, conservation, water gardens, biodiversity gardens. And I'm sure there's a hundred other names you could pull out, be original, come up with something new. Right? I think we could probably name one after Katie Spears, uh, Katie Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I was mixing my metaphors. That's a very popular artist, Katie Spears. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's a sample. So first we look at pollinator gardens. This is big stuff now. I mean, that's what's selling. So what are pollinators? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. If you heard Larry's talk, this is boring. And they're neat because Charles Allen likes them. They're all sort of bees. I think you know what Charles is up, Charles? He loves these uh, iterations. Some of them all mean the same level. So if you have a pollinator garden, it involves growing plants for all of these or any subgroup thereof. And of course, there's some wonderful art online. I steal a lot of stuff from online. Uh, this is probably one of the most fantastic pictures out there on pollinators. Try to find how many pollinators there are in there, and you have to be busy for a while. The 800 pound gorilla in the garden now is the native <coughs> bee. I know you think it's the honeybee. But honeybees are famous for making honey. They're really lousy pollinators. And there's another thing about honeybees most people don't know. They're extremely sensitive to change. They're really good at getting infected by mites and fungi. They're really good at getting killed off by spraying them <laughs> with insecticides. Even a heavy rain will kill them, right? So they are like canaries in the mine. If the bees, if honeybees are dying, you know you got problems. Native bees are a lot tougher. But native bees, native bees require habitat. They don't have hives. 
We lay eggs in the ground or in old wood or in places where we think of as uh, traction places, right? So uh, uh, native bees, they are big and upcoming. Money is being spent on and you can actually sell a garden now to a group who's never been interested in gardening, just trying to save native bees like one of these. The other 800 pound gorilla in the room is the monarch butterfly, the emblematic insect of not only North America, but of birds. And of course, it's got this wonderful migration from Mexico to Canada and back. And that migration is in great threat to survive. Like so many other kinds of wildlife, their numbers are simply crashing, right? Hey, we got a little spike. Oh, I know I can't go back. We got a little spike this year, so we were all excited. And then a mess, it's a huge snowstorm that hit just after the monarchs were leaving. So that number is probably going to crash back down. I'm hoping that's not the case. But that may be the case. What you see here is a trend, and we'll talk about trends toward the end. But this is not just a trend for monarchs, it's for pollinators in general. It's for wildlife in general. Right? But it's emblematic, so it's telling us what the big problem is. I'm a bibliophile, I really love books. And I, when I get into something, the first thing I want to do is get online and order all the books to read about. If you're into butterflies and you want uh, D. Otter's book, Butterfly Gardening for Texas. Uh, in the Pollinator, you know, pollinate, Pollinator Famous Gardening by uh, Hayes. Uh, this one from the Xerxes Society, Pollinators of Native Plants. Oh, this is the Xerxes one. This is Heather Holmes. Hey, it actually backed up. Uh, attracting Native Pollinators. And of course, you want to get into bees at all. You want this one. Beautiful color pictures. So buy the books. Keep those authors. Uh, getting their royalties, it's a big deal. They quit writing if they don't make any money. Yeah. And then you're not getting more books. Uh, native bees are neat. Why? Because there's nearly 5,000 different kinds in North America. This is not a small group of organisms. It's hyper diverse, right? And the thing is, many of them, like 90% of them, are very specific as to either where they live or what plants they pollinate. So as you're losing biodiversity in general, these furry plants disappear, the bees that would have used them for survival disappear likewise. That's the big deal about things being connected. When you pluck out a species, a whole set of species collapses with it. Anyway, beautiful art. Of course, there's nothing as artistic as actually looking at bees while they're doing their work. Whether it's bumblebees, or carbon bees, or even wasps. Although wasps have a traditional role, they're big time predators. So that's a love hate relationship. And more wasps. This is my favorite plant this year. This is sweet coneflower. I pick a favorite plant, a favorite topic each year, and focus on it, try to figure it out. And of course, there are flies that look like bees, but they're also pollinators, right? These circuit flies. I got stuck on them for a while, so I have a few slides of them. Uh, doing different things. You can tell they're not bees because they only have one pair of wings, right? And of course, Gardening for native bees is becoming very popular. People are building houses for the mason bees, for example, or leaving out old logs for these same bees or similar bees, or doing other things, open patches of soil for the bumblebees in the area that they live. Of course, everything I, I speak about has a good side and also a bad side. As soon as we are realizing that Bees are so diverse, so beautiful, so important. What is it, like two out of every five <coughs> bites of food is a product of a bee? Right? Uh, we've eaten grains without bees. 
Uh, a book like this comes out, The Forgotten Followers, and it shows us that we were literally losing all of these beasts because we're taking away their habitat, their native plants that they require, or the soil type they require, or just the place that they exist, because bees oftentimes have a range about the size of this room, and if they don't have the habitat, the food there, and the nesting place there, they're gone. When you build a house, you eliminate habitat. It may be microhabitat. Hopefully there's another pair of bees over the next block that will hang around, but sometimes there isn't. And of course, books like this just drive you nuts. Our Stolen the Future, this is a book about endocrine disruptors. It breaks the silence out there that about the chemicals we use in our age of chemistry. I mean, many of these chemicals are actually very, very potent biological molecules, or mimics them. So this is a book all about endocrine disruptors, things like Roundup, 2,4-D, DDT, atrazine, even soy products, malathion, OPs, the organophosphates, bisphenols in your plastic bottles. All of these are powerful female hormones, and they're changing the way the natural world works. And we can change the way our bodies work. Right? We're becoming very, very female, right? It's kind of scary. But that's the case. I can give you 30 examples, but maybe that's a different thing. And of course, we said, well, we're going to buy into this idea that we can get rid of using uh, poisons like insecticides. So we came up with the idea of putting genes into organisms to do it for us. So we put the Bt gene, the Celsteringiensis gene, into corn to get rid of the corn borer, the corn ear borer. And it really caused us to drop our use of insecticides. Sounds like a great thing. But the use of uh, herbicides went up, right? Because they decided, hey, if we can put that Bt gene in there, we can also put the Roundup gene, re ready gene, in there and really increase our harvest. And that's what we've done. So we'll talk a lot about Roundup. Okay. After all was said and done, the pesticide use in the U.S. didn't change at all, right? And that's the problem. In fact, Roundup usage, glyphosate, has incre increased exponentially right? and continues to do so. And where is it being used? Well, it's being used on cropland, right? So if you grow rice or corn or soybeans, they're spraying you. And this is a very, very powerful female hormone. Whether they're flying it by air, as they do in my house all the time, or somebody, Smith Coat, you name it, your neighbors, I have neighbors who have trucks like this, 500 gallon tanks full of herbicide and 200 foot holes so they can make damn sure they can get to any little spot where there might be some exotic or native plant still left out there. It's got to be clean, not just mowed, clean. Okay? Thus, dilemmas occur. Right? While our gardening efforts are growing arithmetically, use of biocides is growing exponentially. You don't have to be a mathematician to understand what's going on here. If 